So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sharon Whiteman and my partner with Gary, who you see on the screen today, and Donna Hunter, who's behind the scenes today. And we love being here with you every Saturday morning or later down the track whenever you're capable or able to review and take a look at what we've been doing. Today, um, we have the privilege of learning about Steve Edwards. Now he's uh, in the UK, so the time zone is, is always in the middle of the night for them, like one or 2 a.m. So it's not really good for a live recording, but we've been blessed by giving this recording of a recent interview with Steve. And it's really just even reviewing it myself this week, it was inspiring. The things, you know, some things might get you down and you might have a, I'm gonna give up kind of thing. And what he's overcome is really, it, it, you can put it to any place in your life, whether it's, you know, a, a goal, a health goal, a um, exercise goal, or even a business goal, any, any goal that feels unsurmountable or that you've got things stacked against you, have a think about what Steve's attitude has been in his, his journey. So as well as being born with a deformed left hand, Steve Edwards also has a genetic blood disorder known as beta thalassemia minor, leaving him with a permanently low hemoglobin count that compromises the oxygen carrying ability of his body. Putting it simply, it means that his energy level has and will always be around 20% below the norm. And this is a world award-winning marathon man. A professional IT technical support specialist, Steve ran his first marathon in 1981. He was only 18 and completely ignorant to what was involved and therefore had no idea how to train or prepare for it. He remembers getting to the 15 miles and wondering what all the fuss was about, but a mile later he found out he couldn't walk properly for days afterwards and like many others, vowed never again. Anyone facing big goals, whether it's in, in sport or exercise or physicality or business, would can relate to that. Steve was introduced to the Mantec technology by a random call from a stranger offering to let him try a series of products for free to check it out. Always a fan of nutrition, Steve said yes, to, but to his surprise, he noticed improvements in recovery within two weeks. And then he was able and inspired to increase the intensity of training, which led him to better race performances. And he says, wow, I thought I was already doing the best I could. I'm going to, to give these a go. And I started using them more regularly. The following year, I went back to the same event, 10, marathon in 10, 10 marathons in 10 days to defend my record. And I knocked two hours off my previous total. I mean, that's for experienced athletes, that's phenomenal. Mr. Ed Edwards said throughout his life, his motto has been never underestimate your potential and follow your dreams. I was born with a deformed left hand. I was bullied, so I felt excluded. But with running, you're on that start line with thousands of other runners and it doesn't matter who you are in life. Steve's journey is not just about running. It's about pushing boundaries, overcoming obstacles, and living life with an unwavering passion. So please get ready to be inspired as Steve shares his stories, his lessons that led him to these remarkable achievements. So Gary, I'm going to go off camera now and I'll leave you to start the video and I'll sit here and listen with him. Okay. How's that? Yep, yeah, it's perfect. Just full screen now, no good. So good evening, and what an evening it is. Tonight, it is with great honor and admiration that I introduce a true testament to the power of determination and resilience. I want you to imagine running just one marathon, and I know perhaps a few of you done have here tonight. An incredible feat in itself. Now, Multiply that by 1,000. Gary, I've lost sound. Oops. Again. Oh, it's back. <laughs> With his 1,000 sub four hour marathon firmly under his belt, please join me in welcoming the remarkable Steve Edwards. His journey is not just about running. It's about pushing boundaries, overcoming obstacles, and living life with an unwavering passion. So please get ready to be inspired as Steve shares his story, his lessons, and the incredible journey that led him to this remarkable achievement. So please, guys, let's take 20 seconds to get your cameras on, please. Um, I want to see as many. I want more cameras on tonight than any Zoom we've ever had. Brilliant. Here we come, here we come, here we come, here we come. So guys, all cameras on, 
and let's give a fantastically warm and wonderful European world welcome to the man in the machine, Steve Edwards. Yeah. Let's wave those arms. Let's see it. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Thanks, Steve. That's absolutely wonderful. So, Steve, as I said, what a privilege it is to be here with you tonight. Um, what a privilege it is to see to see you. We were there last um, last Monday when Steve actually crossed the line, and and everything was finally sort of not laid to rest. That's a silly expression, but it, the fruition it all happened then. So what I'm going to do, Steve, um, I'd like you to to kick it off, please. Let's share how you feel, and a bit later on, we'll have a few questions. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, firstly, uh, just like to thank you, Mark, for your kind words, and and also thank everybody that was there. On the day, you all helped to make it a really special occasion with your uh, exciting support and enthusiasm. Um, it all added to the emotion and the, uh, you know, the sort of, well, basically the atmosphere on the day, um, along with support from all my family and just about, you know, everybody that I know in the running community all over, all over the country, really. And it really made it a special day for us. Um, I know some of you have been following me for many years now, but this was the uh, finale really to what has been an incredible 43-year journey. But I had no idea to ever go this far when I ran my first race back in 1981. And yeah, what can I say? What an emotional day it was. Um, I mean, we were tired going into it because going into sort of the last couple of weeks, I'd ran, already ran a couple of marathons in the previous two weeks. I'd sustained a hip injury, which I didn't need, certainly didn't foresee on my 996 marathon. So the last sort of four marathons, certainly the last three, were uh, ran with incredible pain. And had it come sort of 20 or 30 marathons before, then, you know, that you know I'd have been in trouble. But thankfully, the gods were on my side. And it was kind of a case, really, of pretty much teeth and uh, putting up with the pain for, that, uh, for those last sort of three marathons and then counting the miles down, really. And, yeah, the emotion started really high, even in the morning. <clears throat> People were arriving. They wanted their photographs with me and shake my hand and, and wish me good luck. And I had a few messages of like, well, it's just another race. It's just another marathon, 26 miles. You've done it 999 times already. So it should be a piece of cake. But, you know, a marathon is not a piece of cake. It's it's such a brutal event. And um, it'll find out your weakness on any given day. And uh, I'd certainly got my weakness with my injury. But I knew that, you know, I had a lot of people um, who'd come down to support me on that day. And just knowing that everybody's waiting back at the stadium for me to finish. That's what drove me on. And coming into the stadium, at the, uh, and I'm, I'm tough to apologise for keeping you all waiting. So I was watching back the video that Catherine took, and uh, <laughs> even I was shouting at the uh, the footy, saying, come on, Steve, where are you? I was getting worried that I wasn't going to come. But anyway, yeah, and I saw that back over the, um, over the footage, and yeah, crossing the line with my son and my grandson, and greeting Teresa, and... Uh, yeah, I was just so emotional. Um, that emotional, in fact, I fell, fell to the ground and just couldn't control myself. I was sobbing that much. But the, even the St. John's ambulance were getting a bit worried. I thought I was uh, really hurt, but no, I was just emotional. But yeah, it was a fantastic day. And then to be presented, which made it all real, with the Guinness World Record certificate, which is there. Um, you know, that's just, for me... It basically just says a few words and, and there's no room on there really to describe everything that's gone into this 43 year journey and, and it is sometimes difficult to articulate but you know what a fantastic finale and a great day and that day really goes up it's probably one of my all-time favorite days in you know my whole life um alongside obviously you know other great occasions that people have um watching their favorite team win the major cup final meeting and marrying with their partner, watching their children being born, those sorts of occasions, you know, they are sort of in the in the top all time life events. And this certainly goes right up there with those. So it was a fantastic day and um yeah, and I'm, I'm dead proud, I'm dead happy and uh just excited to sort of um be here tonight talking to everybody and uh 
just really grateful for all your support, really. So, uh, yeah, happy to answer your questions, Mark. Fantastic, Steve. And as you said, I'm, I haven't checked, but I can't imagine there are many world records that took 43 years to achieve. And that's something that I find absolutely phenomenal. So if it's OK with you, uh, the first question, I think we, we asked a few people for questions is, so how did it all start? And can you tell us a bit about your first marathon, how it felt? Quite by chance, I saw a poster where I, in my hometown of Coventry, I saw a poster advertising the first Coventry Marathon back in 1981. And it was about five, was five or six weeks sort of to go. And I just thought, yeah, why not give it a go? I don't really know what it was that sort of sparked the interest, really. I was consider myself to be fairly fit. I was doing uh, martial arts at the time, um, and, and I was going to a gym. Um, so, But I hadn't really done any running since leaving school. So, yeah, it was. I just I had no idea really how to train for a marathon. I didn't really appreciate the concept of running 26 miles, if I'm being honest. And I guess you could say... Um, Ignorance was bliss, really. So, you know, I turned up on race day, got to just past halfway, wondering what all the fuss was about. I was on my planned target time. And, um, yeah, a mile later, I found out the hard way just how brutal a marathon is and how much it takes out of you and what happens to a human body when you haven't conditioned it, conditioned it properly to run 26.2 miles. So I did manage to get to the finish. I was a few minutes outside of my target time thought I conquered the world waking up and trying to walk the following day and for several days afterwards <laughs> my legs were like gateposts so uh yeah not a great feeling and um I vowed never again actually but what I discovered was apart from how painful a marathon can be if you're not prepared is just what a brilliant sport running is and the health benefits both physical and mental the camaraderie the social aspects of it all and that, to me, was really powerful. And for the first time in my life, having gone through my school years, being bullied at various stages for uh, not being, what you might say, a normal person, in that I was born with a deformed left hand. So, yeah, I, I suffered at the hands of bullies. And I guess first time ever, I, I'd, I'd found something that where I'd found a new self, newfound self-confidence, and, yeah, realised that there were people around and you stood on the start line of an event like that and, and everybody had mutual respect for one another. And that was the first time that I'd experienced that, I guess. Um, so I took my running seriously after that. Um, I uh, stopped doing martial arts to concentrate more on running. I continued with the gym and I entered different races. It wasn't until the late 80s that I started running multiple marathons. And, and initially that was for charity. But then, of course, I realised that there was uh, records to be broken and it was the targets and the pushing myself to the limits, setting those records that sort of drove me on to, to you know, to try to, try to achieve some of those world records. Great. And, and actually, when, when, did you, when did you decide to go for the thousand? What do you think actually set that figure in your head? Um, well, moving on from the late 80s, I'd already... Um, my first record was actually uh, becoming the youngest person to run 100 marathons. And then my second record I went for after that was running the most marathons in a year, which at the time was 87. Both of those have been improved on since. But I'd set myself a, rich, um, a lifetime goal of trying to, get, um, trying to run 500 marathons in the fastest average finish time. And I'd set myself a target of under three hours, 15 minutes. Um, I pretty much hit 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 it really um, really well in 2012 in my 50th birthday year and I really honestly thought that that would be it so the thousand marathon I did it didn't actually come until after that um, I got back in the car after that 500th marathon and uh, you know a a average in that time <laughs> I said to trees I'm not sure she really wanted to hear that but um, I said something along the lines of I know you I know I said to you I was going to retire <laughs> but actually I don't feel too bad and I'm going to see if I can get to 600. So actually, she's my surprise. She didn't seem that bothered about it. She said that's yeah, that's fine. That's that's understandable. 
Uh, the thing is, 600 became 700, and then before long after that, I, I people were starting to talk about a thousand, and I'd had it in my head that perhaps maybe a thousand was possible. And I have to say, sort of from 800 onwards, I was occasionally regretting that decision to put it out there. But I, I just, I just think, you know, if I'd have not gone for it, I'd probably regretted it for the rest of my life. So there's been some painful times. And there's been some days, dark days, when I've really thought I'm not going to do this. And it's been a case of really, really digging deep to try and stay focused. And, um, there have been some difficult times, but I, I would have always regretted it if I had not given it my best shot. So sitting here now, knowing what's been achieved, yeah, I'm just so pleased, so happy. And um yeah, and finally to get the Guinness World Record, that's just the icing on the cake, really. That was just just brilliant. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and you, you have mentioned to, to me about, because we know that um, today we see official marathons all over the place. I mean, relatively speaking, there's almost one a week, I think, it, it just in the, in the south of England. So um, you, you talked about in the early days. So the question was, what was it like trying to organise running all these official marathons, having to travel and fit in with your work and family life? Yeah, I mean, 40 years of doing anything, really, you see a lot of changes. And there's certainly been a lot of changes in the sport of marathon running. Back in the day, uh, certainly when I first started and for many, many years, there were, there were mainly road, um, road race events. Uh, as the years went by, these these road race events became more and more expensive for organisers to uh, to host. So a lot of them went by the wayside. So if you wanted to establish these kind of records, you found that you had to travel well all over Europe really to try and get the numbers in. And um, obviously logistically, that added a whole new um, testing element to it all, I guess. Um, and, and and you were just more tired because you have to travel thousands of miles in between races. Back in those days, you know, there wasn't budget airlines and there was no internet, so everything had to be done <laughs> by uh, by mail and fax and that kind of thing, and, and pretty much drove and bought ferries all over the place rather than fly. So it was just a whole lot more tiring as well. Um, like you say, Mark, I mean, these days, you know, the, the marathon running scene's changed incredibly. Um, there are marathons every week. You, don't, you could, in theory, uh, achieve these records in probably less time um, and without probably leaving the country. But for me, it's always been about not just doing the quantity, but also the quality as well. And this this really, this, this record is what Guinness actually were quite blown away with, the fact that they've been not only done over such a long period of time, um, they're impressed on many levels, really. Uh, one, certainly the um, the average finish time for all 1,000 marathons, which was three hours, 21 minutes, 47 seconds in the end but the longevity of somebody being able to maintain their health and fitness for over 40 years to keep their body going and keep pushing their body and keep performing consistency over a long long period of time so that, that's another thing that you know that they yeah they, they found absolutely amazing so yeah it's um it has changed a lot um I'm under no illusion that somebody will come along and break this at some point, but hopefully it'll, it'll stand for a few years yet. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Um, so can, I think there's a film and a book called The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. So, I mean, could you talk us to a bit about what it's like to run these marathons and where, where are your thoughts? What, what, what are you feeling? It is true. I mean, no matter what size event you're running, whether it's a big city marathon with, you know, huge, huge amounts of uh, people supporting and crowd support to very low key marathons where it's very minimal support with, with very few runners. But at the end of the day, you, you are running in your own pain with your own head and, and you are kind of on your own. Where I've always sort of what I've always tried to focus on is the end goal. And all throughout my marathon journey, I've had targets and, and they've been both short-term and long-term targets. So leading up to the thousand and beyond, and to any of the records or targets, the long-term targets, I've always had short-term targets. And really, you break that right down into running each mile in a particular time, keeping each mile to a certain pace. 
reaching halfway in a certain time, reaching sort of 20 miles in a certain time. Um, but not really looking at the bigger picture too much. I mean, it's always there in the background. But I've always gone into each race and prepared literally as if it's my last race that I've ever, you know, that I'm ever going to run. So um, all the planning for each race has been meticulous, been a great sort of um, shown great attention to detail for each race. Um, really try to adopt what um, an elite athlete would do in their professional career in terms of making sure that every tiny thing that you can possibly do to improve your um, performance, improve your recovery, improve, you know, everything, it's all small margins, which probably only make neg you know, negligible gains in, in one race, but over a thousand marathons, they've made a huge amount of difference. Um, and during the race, really, just focusing on, yeah, those small, small little targets within each race, um, trying to imagine that I'm sharing the pain that I'm running in with all the other people who they're all going through the same different types of different pain. It's tiredness, muscle soreness, aching limbs. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's a brutal event. And, and if you're unprepared properly, then, you know, it will, will sort of find you out. Um, I think I've quoted before that, you know, a marathon distance, depending on your stride length, is equates to about 35 to 39,000 steps. And every time you put your foot down in one of those steps, you put in something like three to four times your body weight through all of the joints. So that in itself, I think you can sort of kind of imagine the stress that you're putting on your whole body, you know, when you run. You've got, your body's got to be durable to run, fairly durable to run one marathon. It's got to be extremely durable to be able to run many, many marathons. Indeed. Sorry, no, I'm grinning because I know that we're, we're going to be talking about just a minute exactly what helped you do your last 550. I love what you said there. Um, a huge record to break, a huge goal set, should I say. But it, it comes down to every every step, doesn't it? It comes down. I think you once said one of the most important parts of the marathon is the first step you take over the start line because once you know you've started, you, there's there's short of a, I don't know, a, a natural hurricane or something or a strike, a stroke <laughs> of lightning, you will always finish, which is interesting. And, 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 and there is a comparison to be to what we do with Manatech and how we share small increments, small building blocks lead to greatness, which is fantastic. And it's so beautiful to hear you talking like that. So, Steve, where, where in the world did you run? And are, do you have any great stories about chasing kangaroos or kangaroos chasing you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um... I should have uh, thought about interesting stories, but uh, I thought I could think of one or two. I've run all over the British Isles from the Outer Hebrides, um, right the way down through Scotland, Wales, all different parts of England, Isles of Scilly, Isle of Man, Isle of Wight, Jersey, Guernsey, pretty much all over Europe, Scandinavia. Um, in terms of long haul marathons, yeah, I've been over to the States, over in New York, Chicago. Vegas, Dallas, um, Los Angeles. Uh, furthest away I've been to is um, Auckland Marathon in New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, like I say, it has been an incredible journey, not just a running journey, but just a journey of discovery and, and learning. Um, not only, you know, just how amazing your human body is and what it can withstand if, if you push it to the limit, uh, but also you know, just visiting different countries, making many new friends. The whole thing, you know, we've been to places, you know, we wouldn't have necessarily gone to had it not been for a race and we're really pleased to have gone. So um, one story that springs to mind, I was, um, so we just ran a marathon in Germany uh, this particular Saturday and the next one was in Switzerland the following morning. So I think I'd gone third or second, I'd won some prize money. It was in German marks, which was, quite good because it meant we could get a meal um, and in local currency we couldn't really hang around for that long and then we jumped in the car and I was literally speeding all the way to try and get over to the border and get near to where the next race was so we could uh, get our heads down for the night unfortunately there was um, armed Swiss police in one of the tunnels that you go through as you're going just over the border anyway they pulled us over because they thought we were a terrorist or something <laughs> but I was speeding and it took 
so long to convince them that I was just a runner and I was on my way to another race and I was trying to say, look, I've won some money and here's my running shoes and here's my kit bag. And anyway, I had to follow them down to their station and uh, <laughs> he said, well, we'll let you go with the caution. He says, but you owe us, you know, a fine and this is how much it's going to be. So basically the rest of my winnings from that race, I had to hand over in, in a fine and a penalty. So, uh, but in all fairness, I was just glad they let me go and I was able to get to the race and uh, get my head down for two or three hours um, in time to you know, prepare for the uh, the marathon that day. So that was one that was one event, which at the time was quite serious. But I look back at that, it's it's quite amusing, really. So um, then there was another occasion. Actually, this is probably the worst time. Uh, one of the worst experiences was. I'd run a marathon in um, Enschke Day. Um, again, I'd, I'd ran really well that day, I think. Finished quite high up. Um, but I was trying to get back to, to catch the earliest ferry possible because I was running back in Britain in, on the Sunday. But um, I hadn't realised how tired I was and, and I actually fell asleep at the wheel. And um, yeah, I had a bit of a nasty, a nasty accident on the motorway and the car turned and that was the moment I thought I was going to die. But um Thankfully, the car stopped rolling and, uh, yeah, still alive. And my family were with me at that time and we were all still here. And I thought, wow, and I just, you know, that was a real wake-up call. Um, and that was one of those moments where you just think, you know, how did we get out of that? But that was probably the worst moment of probably my whole running career. Thankfully, that was probably the only time when something bad like that happened. Thank God. But um, yeah, many, many sort of, you know, like happy times more than, should we say, sad times, I think. Um, but as a journey, I've always said that you have to experience the lows, the very lows to really appreciate the highs. And when you do get failure, failure is just part of the, it's just part of the, um, the journey, really. And when you do, when I do say failure, I mean, well, what is, what is failure? Well, you know, you, you fall down, so you get back up. You fall down, you get back up. And this is what you keep doing. And um, eventually you get back up and you stay up and you, you succeed in what you know and where you're going. And that, when you succeed at that point, it makes that success even more sweeter than because you've experienced sort of lows on the way. So that's that's the way I view it, really. And I think if I'd have sailed through it without any issue, I don't think I'd really appreciate the success and there's one saying that always springs to mind um, that I've always liked, and that's um, if your dreams don't scare you, then they're not big enough. And I think for me, that's that couldn't be more true. Wonderful, absolutely. Gosh, what a story! I have to, yeah, I've, I've only been involved luckily in one serious car crash. No one was hurt, but I know that feeling when everything suddenly you're going upside down and sideways. And I can appreciate and share with you how I must have felt. Um, so I think this is uh, moving into the section that's probably the question on, on, on everyone's lips is, uh, so how did you hear about Manatech? What were your thoughts about it? And what made you say yes? It's an interesting one, actually, because I, I actually remember the day really well. So I just got back to work from having set first world record for running fast, the fastest 10 marathons in 10 days. And I got back into work, and this was in 2008. And I had a phone call come through to the office. Um, I'm not sure how they even found out where I worked, what my number was. They must have found it out from the press. There'd been quite a lot of press coverage of this world record. And she explained she was an associate with Manatech, who have a range of really sort of world-class um, nutritional supplements. Um, she began to tell me the story of, you know, why she thought they might benefit me. Um, that they would make me a better runner than what I already was. And I didn't poo-poo it because I'd always been a big believer in nutrition, in good nutrition anyway. It was always part and parcel of my, if you like, my overall kind of package of what I need to do to try and achieve these records. The thing is, I thought I was doing you know, the best I could anyway with, with the supplements that I was using and, and, and my nutrition anyway. But I've never been one to turn down an opportunity. And when she said, well, you could try these products for free and just see how you go. And if you don't think they're doing you any good or you don't 
can't see any difference, then nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I thought, yeah, it's a fair enough comment. And I always think back to the first marathon that I ran. You know, that was an opportunity. I could have just walked away. But I thought, no, you, you know, opportunities come along in life. And sometimes you've got to just take them because you don't know where they're going to lead. And I think for me, I just at that point, I just thought, no, I'm going to see, see, um, see if they do me any good, you know. Amazingly, within less than two weeks, I was beginning to find I was recovering from my training sessions better. Bear in mind that I'd be training at lunchtimes. My training consisted at the time of sort of cycling to work, running at lunchtime, and then cycling home again. So quite, quite probably two hours of training each day, and that was on top of sort of core strength work and weight sort of three or four times a week. So quite an intensive training regime and recovery from that is so crucial, obviously, to for muscle repair and, and getting, you know, the rest and everything so you can go back into the next training session, um, having recovered to a certain extent. And then obviously recovering for your races. So, but yeah, within two weeks, I noticed my body was recovering a lot quicker. Um, I was actually able then to increase the intensity of my training. And with the intensity being increased, that started to lead to better race performances. I mean, wow. <laughs> I thought I was doing the best I could, what I was doing at that time. The proof in the pudding came. I basically I agreed. I thought, wow, I'm going to give these a go. And, and I sort of started using them more regularly. And the following year, I went back to the same event, 10 marathon, 10 days to defend my record. And I knocked two hours off my total 10 marathons in 10 days time and I finished runner up um, only to be beaten by somebody half my age so the record that I had obviously was broken but the I'd set a new veteran um, so when you're 40 plus in, in running terms you become a veteran that veteran course record still stands to this day nobody over the age of 40 has broken that record and that, and that was done in 2009 but for me, that, that sold it. After that first year of being on the supplements from Manatech, I realised that these were going to really help me in terms of my recovery, my performance, and also my longevity in the sport. And funnily enough, it meant that I actually reached the 500 marathon goal in 2010 instead of 2012. And what I, what I then decided to do was to, to improve the average finish time over the following two years so that I was able to achieve that 500 marathon goal of a sub three hour, 15 minute average. And I think, to be honest, I mean, I don't know, but it certainly has helped me go beyond the 500 to six and to seven and ultimately to a thousand because it's, it's such a huge thing. It's such a huge part of any athlete's um, journey, you know, getting their nutrition right. So, yeah. Fantastic. And I can imagine, so the fact that your body, I think you said in your book that you noticed within two weeks that your muscle tone started to change even. It was that profound, or perhaps, you know, when you were talked about recovery. Uh, and, and I can imagine how, so from a physical point of view, there's a huge feedback to how you're feeling in your head, isn't it? So your mental attitude, your attitude towards the whole thing must have improved as well. I think, I think it's fair to say that I've just felt a lot sharper. I mean, after a training session, after you cycle to work, you have a training session at lunchtime. The afternoons generally, I mean, I was, I would, my job was based around sort of um, IT support and uh, running an IT team. And we'd be faced with some pretty um, sticky situations where you really had to concentrate and think. And um, sometimes those afternoons, I remember not being quite sharp or with it. But, you know, I, I found that I was recovering pretty quickly from those training sessions. So... The day, you know, those afternoons at work weren't so, um, should we say, you know, I felt a lot sharper in the afternoons than I've ever done for a long time. So that was certainly noticeable. Um, I mean, they've just helped with everything, really. I mean, just haven't, I guess, appreciated just probably how much training required for running multiple marathons takes out of your body. Um and I think as well as you get older, that's been the thing. As I've got older, what most people have been absolutely amazed by is just how I've been able to keep going. Yeah, okay, my times aren't as good as they were when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s, but 
they're not a million miles away and on average and just I think that's just what amazed people just how I've been able to keep keep my body going over that period of time and keep my time so sort of consistent really wonderful absolutely so of course the, the big question on everyone's lips is um you could talk to us about the products that you have been using and if you have a favorite one do you want to share that with you or even a favorite 10 <laughs> favorite 10 well they're all favorites um uh, I guess really the main one of the game ones that really do it for me the Ambrotose life uh, just basically because Cellular your health, cellular health, health from the inside, as I like to think of it, um, supporting and maintaining many body functions. Um, and basically, it's just I just find it is like the optimum product, really, to help aid, keep everything going, keep everything optimum and to uh, aid recovery. But I also like Nutrivirus, um, again, an all-rounder, um, an all-round supplement, you know, which, which I know will give me food-based minerals, vitamins, antioxidants, Basically, everything I need to help keep my body, opt, you know, in optimum shape, um, and also help boost my immunity. Um, and I have to say, immunity, that immune system is just, it gets absolutely battered with all the training and the racing that I've had to do over many years. So having that support from from a supplement, you know, is brilliant. And um, having the immune start along with that as well, I think, has uh, definitely helped sort of keep me from being run down um that's not to say i don't i haven't got tired of course i've got tired but you know it's um you know i know some athletes and they're just you know they're always got a cold or they've got a tummy bug or something you know and it, their body's run down a lot and it's a fine line being able to sort of train as hard as you possibly can without breaking down so that you just you, you still you know you sort of meet that red line where you can't go over it you try to get as close as you possibly can to it to give give you optimum fitness. Um, Mega three, uh, my joints, um, heart and uh, brain health, um, bounce back. I mean, bounce back. I, I, I wouldn't want to be without that really. I mean, it's it's great for inflammation, sore muscles, joints. So I use that regularly. Uh, sport as well. Um, so depending on how my training has been and, and how many races I've been doing, um, the frequency of races, I use varying amounts of sport depending on you know my schedule really. But again, you know, that's that helps for me anyway. It's helped with um, utilising the energy from the carbohydrate that I'm eating, so I get the maximum um, effect out of that, and also aid recovery from muscle soreness, that kind of thing. Um, gut health as well is one of those sort of things in athletes that is really important so GI Pro Balance has been brilliant for that in terms of maintaining you know a really healthy digestion system and you know with the amount of calories that I'm having to eat every day you know, that's really really important um, and GI Zyme sort of aid to help back that up really so that I know that I'm getting uh, maximum nutrient absorption from all the food that I'm eating um, and then impact, I guess, is probably the other one. Um, you know, it's a great all-round drink. Um, using it before, during, and, and even afterwards as well in terms of um, giving you energy, giving you electrolytes, and, and also helps with your recovery as well. So just find the whole, you know, there's loads and loads of products, but they're the ones for me as an athlete that I've found to be, um, you know, the most important. And I just think they all complement one another in what they're all able to do. So, you know, it'll just give me sort of all good, all round good body health. Um, and all of that whilst trying to push my body to the absolute limit. And um, and I'm sure it's that that's helped, helped with my longevity. If I had to pick one of those things about sort of, you know, performance and um consistency and longevity longevity really is is what anybody wants in any sport they want to keep going for as long as they can brilliant brilliant thank you um so how many times are you in the guinness book of records steve please can you clear that up for me so this there's, there's a few unofficial records but the official records that, that have been in and well i'll start from the beginning so the youngest person to run 100 marathons that's since been broken. I was 28 years old when I managed that. Um, the most marathons run in one year, which at the time was 87. And again, 
they were in the days when you had to travel all over the place to to run that many marathons. You could run that many within, I don't know, three or four months, I think, within the UK now. But uh, so that's since been broken. Uh, the fastest 10 marathons in 10 consecutive days, that was the third official world record. Uh, again, that's been broken. Um, and then the one that I achieved last Monday, which, uh, yeah, that could choose the fastest um, official title, is the fastest aggregate time to run 1,000 marathons. So um, I'm hoping that will stand for a few years. So don't intend trying to repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And and I, I know you did mention it a bit at the beginning, but, but would you mind, as, as we move towards the end here, would you just take us back to how it felt to cross the finishing line last week in Milton Keynes? I think just so emotional, just so many mixed emotions, one of excitement, relief, um, oh, it, disbelief. Yeah, just disbelief. This is the end. This is the end of an era. This is what we've been working towards for 43 years. OK, I didn't know it 43 years ago that I'd be running over the line to run the thousandth marathon and breaking a world record. But it, it's to, to feel that it's almost like the whole of my life was flashing before me just in those few seconds. And I just wanted to hug, find Teresa and give her a big hug. And then, gosh. I don't think I've cried for two minutes solidly for a long, long, long time. That was that was it. It was just like every emotion just pouring out of me. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just it just came out. I just couldn't couldn't stop it. It just all came out. It just and and, and, and yeah. <laughs> I, I think we all we all were. All the manatekas were there. Everyone. So many people online that were experiencing, thanks to Catherine's great directing and uh, and live live filming and stuff. Uh, I, I agree. And there is a there's a great there's a great um, statement or quote that says, "Behind every great man, there is a great woman." Yeah. And I do know for sure that with regards to you and your team, Edwards, I know there's someone hopefully who might be close by at this very minute uh, that you couldn't really have done it without. And uh, if, if she wouldn't mind, and if you wouldn't mind, can we just see Theresa, sorry, the yeah. association very briefly, just to yeah. say so much and yeah. send her all the love that you both deserve, really. Okay, just give me 30 seconds, okay? You got it, you got it. <laughs> Wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, lovely. Yeah. So as I said, behind every great man, there is a great woman. Oh, man. Hey! Woo! <laughs> I'm here! <laughs> Hi, Teresa. Hi, oh. Team Edwards. Team Edwards, fantastic, Teresa. Oh. It's a privilege to have been seen. I've seen Teresa at work. Steve's coming in at, at the turning around point or a drink stop, and she's there 100 yards out to yes. give him something, which she then... <laughs> And then running after him down to get him, get him another <laughs> bottle of that plus for yeah, another Yeah, sometimes I don't there. quite get the pit stop right, but uh, I'm there and I'm ready to run if he misses out on anything. <laughs> but it's very rare that happens. It, it, it's, it's, it's been a great team effort. That's no, really it's, a, great it's team absolutely team beautiful. And Thank I've you enjoyed so much. it. And just the last question for tonight, if you don't mind staying with us, Teresa, is so what does the future hold for Team Edwards? <laughs> Some quality time together, some travelling, <laughs> um, not putting ourselves under pressure to be up early, you know, in the early hours of the morning to get from A to B, and just to week to week, week to week, yes, yeah. just to take things a little bit more leisurely, which is what we've been doing this last week, to be honest, Mark, and I've really enjoyed it, and I think you have too. <laughs> well, that's not to say there won't be another marathon. No. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, I was going to say. And just last word, please, Steve, for you, you. Well, you just kind of said it, that there could be other marathons, but I'm sure just for the sheer hell of the it or the sheer pleasure of it, I should imagine. We'll see. Yeah, not made my mind up yet, but um, keep thinking in my head, you know, there's still some competitive races left in me, but um, like Teresa says, 
the the running marathons every single week you know that that really has to stop um i've definitely drawn a line into that this this record that we've both achieved really should have both our names on it this this record has been has been the pinnacle of everything and it goes way beyond anything we could have ever imagined when we first started so i'd like to think there's going to be some competitive marathons in the future i'm a vet 60 now um you know you're running your age category you know as you get older and uh well who knows I can't say yet. I need I need a bit of rest, a bit of R and R, gather my thoughts, see where we go. Who knows? Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, look, guys, thank you so so much for sharing, Steve. We've had the privilege of knowing you since two thousand eight, approximately. We might have met you somewhere around at a convention, um, and I, I know without well, I know for sure that you're in, you've inspired thousands of people, not just Manatekas, but in the marathon world around you and we know that that's why they call you the man in the machine with the great team behind you so um from us all here i know um we send enormous love and 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 thank you for inspiring us all to get up and to share what we have i think that's it really i don't want to say any more because it's just brilliant so thank you all thank you all thank you all for being on the call and please if you are if you do have your cameras on please out of respect for Steve, could you kindly come online very briefly and just show yourself, which would be wonderful. Let's have some more cameras on and we can all give this incredible man, this man that's been leading from the front for all this time. Gary, yeah, that's good. It's finished now. How wonderful that is. And if that <laughs> is um, uh, an underlying statement for a leader, it certainly is. So, Steve... We, I know on behalf of everyone here, we love you. Thank you so much for being part of our Manatech journey. And um, we do hope to see you very soon. It's been a pleasure. Just like to thank everybody for all their support over the years. It really is appreciated. And, um, you know, having that support from everybody, you know, person is only as good as the team they've got around them. And, uh, you know, without everybody's help and support, you know, I don't could have achieved all, all that we have. So, yeah. Thanks for having us and um, thank you again, everybody, for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very, very much. Um, and we'll finish now. Um, but wasn't that inspiring? I know it's nice to have live, but um, I think you could probably listen to that on your walks so or driving in the car every day and be re inspired. So, um, yeah, thank you to Sinead for organizing that and um, for Mark Sullivan for his generosity. And next week we have Karen, Dennis and Poppy. We're focusing on incentive strategies. So, you know, as we all know, it's really important to start fast in an incentive and also um, de be dedicated and focused in its best. It's really important to learn from others. They're going to Poppy and Karen are very successful in achieving incentives and in their business and they're going to share their secrets with us. So it's quite a privilege. So uh, we'll see you guys next week. And <laughs> Gary's, we're all wowed by um, Mr. Edward. So let's uh, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next Saturday. Bye, everyone.